We made a video together, both of us sitting side by side many months ago, discussing what it was like for me to grow up communist, that my parents really consciously and intentionally raised me to be a communist, and I am today an anti-communist. I'm not merely not communist, I'm someone who's a pretty vocal critic of the history and current day political reality of communism. That video, which is quite enjoyable in its way, is largely about who my parents were and their motivations. And I wanted in this video to have a bit more of a focused analytical approach um, to, I think, something we all experience. In childhood, we're presented with a lot of information that doesn't make sense. Whether you grow up uh, Christian, atheist, Jewish, communist, Republican. And I think we tend to select and hold on to the little pieces that make sense to us. We create a rational world for ourselves out of the irrationality of what adults are burdening us with. And of course, it may not be that the adults are trying to baffle you, but obviously as a child, um, the barrage of disorganized information you get watching, say, television news, watching NBC News or CBC News or any other mainstream news source, that's something you have to kind of make sense of. You pick up little bits and pieces of that you carry away with you. And most likely your parents' ideology, or maybe even the ideology you were presented with in school, something in this way, you, you, you pick and choose. And I think what you hold on to and what lasts are the parts that make sense to you from the perspective as a child. So, And I'm interested here also in just saying a little bit about how this shaped my adult engagement with politics. Most obviously for my current audience, vegan politics. This doesn't really have anything to do with First Nations politics or Canadian politics or uh, Southeast Asian politics, you know, uh, uh, honestly. So, you know, one of the biggest overall impacts on me that my parents' communist ideology had was the assumption that the job of the government was to take care of the poor. And when the government did this poorly, <laughs> if, if the government failed in taking care of the poor, the poor would rise up and tear down the government. And this was the major pattern or rhythm or heartbeat in history, that governments would work well for a while, whether you're talking about medieval kingdoms or renaissance or modern, but then after some time, the government would become irresponsible, arrogant or corrupt or something. And then... Um, you know, the, the, the poor would rise up and, and tear down the government. And this is based, above all else, on a very slanted, selected reading of the history of the French Revolution. I think people today, left wing, right wing, and center, I think people today really underestimate the unique importance of the French Revolution and of what Karl Marx has to say about the French Revolution to communists, socialists, and the whole left end of the spectrum. So I mentioned this, I'm partly just talking about my childhood, but right now I've started on a project of trying to read history textbooks, current, present-day history textbooks in communist China, and I'm very interested in how they now present the history of the French Revolution to students in China, because I know they're not, um, they're not presenting the kind of Marxist analysis of the French Revolution, nor the American Revolution, for that matter. It's an interesting question. Um... And it's true. I mean, this this is the funny thing. So again, what do you hold on to? What lasts? The things that seem to make sense to you. And that is something a child can understand. I saw a uh, comment here on YouTube the other day from a black stand-up comedian, African-American stand-up comedian, D.L. Hughley. And this is because I just saw it yesterday. This is almost a direct quotation. He said that he thought it was immoral and unjust that American politics should be ruled and controlled by the losers in the economic and education system. The people who had the least money and people who had failed, failed to who had not succeeded in their education and career should have decisive saying. He went on to directly insult and ridicule uh, people in Rust Belt cities like Detroit, that these were the people who had elected uh, Donald Trump, and that this was these were the people Donald Trump was responding to. And from his perspective, he said, again, this is almost a perfect quotation, he said, you know, if, if you've been a failure economically, you should have less to say in politics, not more. So this guy was an African-American stand-up comedian. He doesn't think of himself as elitist. You know, he doesn't think of himself 
as having aristocratic attitudes or plutocratic attitudes. Um, but to me, that is still a shockingly, <laughs> it's a shockingly authoritarian, elitist, top-down attitude. That to me, I mean, so it reminded me of my kind of child, the ideology I was molded into in childhood. And that today, whether I'm reading Aristotle or Thucydides or, you know, ancient Greek political philosophy, or I'm looking at American political philosophy, it's very funny, but like, look, Starbucks caters to the rich, you know, um, fancy shoe corporations cater to the rich. Uh, there are so many services provided, obviously on a for-profit base to the rich. Government is precisely supposed to be the one part of our society that is not by and for the rich. And it's mind-blowing to me that people don't get that. That no, the one sector of a society that's supposed to really be concerned about working by and for the poor is, uh, is government. So that struck me the other day that that in some ways, as a very, very broad assumption, had, had stayed with me. Um, the, you know, the deep assumption that at all times the poor were uh, on the side of peace and that the rich were the ones somehow conniving and conspiring to drag them into war, that the poor represented all the virtues of the world and the rich represented all the evils, and that there's this conflict, you know, between them. This is part of, quote-unquote, internationalism in communism, communist internationalism. And of course, you know, even as a child, I started to figure out that was untrue. I can remember asking my father directly. It'd be hard for me to figure out, was I 8 years old or 11 years old or what? But I can remember asking him, I said, you know, but what you're saying, how can this be true? I'd seen in the newspapers at the time, the vast majority of the working class, like people with jobs as factory workers, the vast majority of the poor in Canada at that time voted for the Conservative Party. The vast majority of them are pro-American and pro-war. You know, just in the newspaper, the news, you saw this. Our working class, I mean, just now, as mentioned, the working class just voted for Donald Trump or what have you. It's just not true that the working class or the poor are this repository of left-wing virtues and that somehow it's this small elite. And on the other hand, of course, I was presented with all of these examples of, of uh, wealthy and sometimes literally aristocratic people who had become left-wing uh, icons. Um, but, you know, even people who represented somebody like George Bernard Shaw, sort of champagne socialists and this kind of thing, that, you know, wealth didn't, uh, wasn't linked to being the sort of right-wing warmonger and poverty was not linked to being a, a left-wing, you know, peacenik. So that was one of the things that, that started to unravel. Um, so just say, in contrasting just these two points, um, one, the idea that the government's, you know, most fundamental responsibility is to help people who cannot help themselves, you know, that stay with me. But then two, this is like the antithesis of my parents' philosophy in part, it's the government's responsibility to help those people just because they need help, period. Not because they're good, not because they're morally superior to the rich or something, and not because they have the power to tear down the government. They don't. I and mean, one of the things that was to shock me when I moved past the propaganda version of history to real political history was that most of those revolutions in France, what was being left out of the story was the, the military. That in reality, these were military coup d'etat. I mean, this obviously shows even in the, the farce that was Napoleon rising to power and so on, that no, this wasn't really peasants with pitchforks that decided the course of history. That was a communist version that omitted all the people who had cannons. You know, it was cannons, not pitchforks that really mattered. What what really happened in the, the rise and fall this way. Um, anyway, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of this because I think a lot of us imagine we're raising our children without any political ideology. And it, it was shocking to me when I talked to my father for the first time after 10 years of silence between us and quite hostile, invidious silence, he knew, I mean, he knew I disapproved of him. And of course, he disapproved of a lot of things I'd done in my life. Some of them he admired and respected to whatever, you know, extent. Um, you know, going to Cambodia and doing humanitarian work or this kind of thing. You know, but uh, obviously, I mean, he had spent his life justifying the massacre of Buddhists by communist regimes, you know, including China. And I converted to Theravada Buddhism. There were a lot of really obvious gaps. He was a hardcore communist and I was, I was anti-communist. 
But when I talked to him for the first time after 10 years of NVIDIA silence, he insisted to me that he hadn't raised me communist at all. And this was quite a long, fierce debate where I was really trying to explain to me, like, no, I mean, this is untrue. You know, everything from the, the books I read as a child, the books that were literally on my bookshelf, the books that were given to me in the same way that a Christian family gives their kid Bible stories. You know, like they don't, you know I mean? They're, they're four children versions of communist propaganda. I even had a board game. Um, I remember seeing an article about it. As I recall, the board game was called Class Struggle. <laughs> it was like Monopoly. You know, the board game Monopoly, we move around the outside. But the point isn't to get rich. The point is to lead the revolution and destroy capitalism. <laughs> but even that board game, at the beginning, you were supposed to roll, roll the dice to decide which social class you were, whether you were like a factory worker or a miner. But the game was easier. You were in a more powerful position if you started as a medical doctor or another like bourgeois, like middle class wealthy person. You were in a better position to win the game. You had advantages by not being working class. I remember my mother was once in the room when I started a game with a friend. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to roll the I want to play as the medical doctor. I want to play as, you know, I picked one of these. So I think you medical doctor or architect. There was some other wealthy profession there. And my mom laughed and she said, no, you can't choose. The point of the game is you have to roll the dice. And I'm playing with it. I was like, no, but it's easier to win if you start as a medical doctor. <laughs> there was communist propaganda in the home in this way, you know, uh, adapted to kids. Um... But, you know, it, it, it was it, it kind of chilling. It's kind of a warning to all of us that my father, who, you know, sat and talked to me about Karl Marx and Lenin uh, and Stalin and Mao Zedong for hours during my childhood, as I've said, much more. Even if your father was a rabbi or something, he might not have cared that much about Judaism or Jewish philosophy. He might not have had that much to say, but I've known a lot of very secular, even atheist rabbis, you know, um, uh, but, you know, the hours and hours put into it, yet he perceived himself as not having raised us as communists, you know, at all. And that, I mean, in as much as he was capable of being sincere about about anything, that was a sincere perception. So one more, one more thing here. Um, you know I had many, many brothers, brothers and sisters. I was the ninth child my father had. And it's interesting, I have, a, I have an example of how his own faith crumbled. Um, in at least some some ways, in contrasting how I grew up to how my older brothers and sisters grew up. But, you know, the late motif of, uh, say, my older brother Adam's life, just to pick one of them. So Adam is 15 years older than me, some of that, very, very roughly. So they're all old men now, those guys. And my oldest brothers, I think, are about 20 years younger than me, some of that. Um, very round numbers here. But, you know, uh, Adam, what he was always taught by my father was the morally uplifting quality of work. That working in a factory, like, elevated you really spiritually. I think that's a good way to put it in communism. That repetitive, mindless labor, doesn't matter, can be in a sock factory. Um, and at one point, that same brother, he did actually work in a, an anorak factory, like a winter coat factory. <laughs> he, had, he had some factory jobs in his day. Uh, but, you know, kind of the lowest and humblest job as a janitor or a factory worker, that this was somehow morally and spiritually uplifting. So, you know, the belief in the future revolution and communism and so on is all, is all linked into this. And I got to see that by the time I was growing up, my father had lost that faith. And actually, I think one of the things that shook it, I was reminded of this now by mentioning rabbis, one of my uncles was a rabbi. He was actually my great uncle. And I remember he had this theory of human psychological development that was all about leisure and play. So there were different philosophers who talked about that, including Aristotle. But I think uh, some of the big uh, psych uh, psychiatrists like Jung and so on, the idea of just having time sitting and playing, of having disor not organized education, but disorganized time at leisure and, and play, this was important for both adult and child psychological development. And I remember my father must have just hit some breaking point where, you know, he recognized, no, drudgery is drudgery. Like, you don't learn anything from having a meaningless, you know, blue-collar job that standing in a factory or working in construction and this kind of thing. And the, the, this, so, I mean, he never, 
explicitly discussed that with me, but I saw a lot of indirect discussions where I could see he had lost his faith. He had lost his faith in work, you know. And uh, when I finished college, I actually applied for and, and was offered. I got a job on a demolition crew. So that's part of the construction industry. That's literally taking a sledgehammer and breaking up uh, cinder blocks, which, yeah, so my girlfriend is smiling. She knows I'd be into that. <laughs> Just the sheer brute physicality of that, of showing up and, and you know, demolishing and hauling off pieces of scrap metal and that stuff, you know, just uh, doing that every day. And my father was so shocked and so horrified, and he, he refused to let me do the job in a totally incoherent way. So yeah, for him at least, that that fell apart. Yeah. So anyway, look, um, I think I was the most cerebral and self-aware of all my brothers and sisters about this stuff that I really thought about the doctrine of communism in my early childhood when I accepted it. And I really thought about it and consciously made a shift in transformation when I rejected it and thinking about what I was rejecting. And even in uh, school textbooks about history, that I was finding the raw material that both supported and challenged the narrative about the history of the world that I was raised, you know, to believe. But, um, you know, I mean, I guess just one other thing to say, finally, I guess one positive thing about parents raising their kids communist is that it doesn't teach them that they're special. It doesn't teach them that they're a gift to the world or doing something positive the world. It teaches you if you want to do something positive for humanity, you've actually got to get out there and make it happen. Right. Sorry, that was the other thing I want to say here. So you've got to get out there and make it happen. And yes, I had examples like uh, the revolutionaries in uh, Vietnam who went out and lived in a cave with a machine gun. You know, that kind of really extreme military uprising form of communism. And even Cuba and stuff, they tell lies. I mean, their version of Cuban, the Cuban Revolution is really different from reality. But anyway, uh, Vietnam is a good enough example. Um, and, you know, at that time also, there were kind of the, there was the communist version of the history of South Africa, of how uh, the Communist Party challenged... Uh, apartheid and fought for the upliftment of black people in South Africa. Again, communist version of history, but you know, obviously there's some truth to it in terms of what the Communist Party was doing in South Africa. Um, but you know, the other big thing that came out of it, I was thinking of this yesterday as we were walking in, in the streets of Dijon, France. Um, the idea of what it meant to be an intellectual and to form a salon you know, of, of the history of the Enlightenment in Europe. Because again, if you're anti-imperialist, what made European civilization special? Not imperialism, not the empire, not England and France conquering the Caribbean and enslaving native people. What made Europe special or exceptional? Well, the answer is the Enlightenment. Was, the Enlightenment is an historical period. And then the emergence of science and new philosophies from the Enlightenment. What made the Enlightenment happen? Well, you know, this reaction against the oppressive church, but these small groups of men ultimately gathering in coffee shops, but it could be 15 guys or something. And yes, some of them were aristocrats and some of them were bourgeois businessmen and, and a few were honest working poor men who were somehow brilliant or inventive. But you know, uh, like uh, Holbach and Helvetius, the Baron de Holbach, if you guys want an example, who was one of the first to really publish about atheism in an explicit way, because of course it was censored for that, and forming small groups of intellectuals who wrote about literature and history and politics and science and who created new encyclopedias. That also definitely had a formative influence on me where I could see things like, okay, science fiction, which is very appealing to most children, but maybe especially male children. Okay, I saw what it meant to be an author of science fiction, someone like Robert A. Heinlein, who I read as a child, but anyway, someone who just writes books or makes some movies and stories. And then I could see over here, then there are these creative writers who are trying to change the world. And the difference is precisely politically organizing that salon, that group, that social circle. Um, whether it's in the sciences or literature or philosophy or, or directly politics or what have you. And I guess it's definitely true from the first moment I came here on YouTube. Still that idea, as I said so many times, like, look, you need five people, 15 people. You need people who come together and pool, pool their efforts and resources and time and criticize each other's work, engage in productive critique of each other's writing. You know, this is not a game one man can play alone, that you need that salon 
you know, um, you need that again in the in the kind of 18th century sense, an academy of people, not meaning a, an actual university or institution, but an academy that could be 20 guys who meet at a coffee shop once every two weeks. You know, before the internet, that was really the engine of social change that made uh, that made the Enlightenment happen. And it is it is ultimately as the harbingers of Enlightenment European thought to the world that communism took on its sense of moral purpose. That for China, for Vietnam, and even for most of Russia, that it was them catching up with something really special that happened in Western Europe when people threw off the chains of medieval Catholicism. You know, at, at the end of the at the end of the Renaissance.